Bye, thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all this morning to Sutton Coalfield Crematorium, where we're gathered not simply to say a final goodbye to Roger, but to take some time together to remember his life, to reflect upon his life. But most of all, we're here today to celebrate Roger's life. We're living through very strange times. Without these restrictions, this chapel would have been full to bursting with people all wanting to show their love and respect for Roger. And you're all sitting facing me with face masks on. If you want to remove those at any time, please feel free to do so. I don't have any problems with that whatsoever. But what can I tell you about Roger? Well, of course, he was a fun-loving man. He had a shall we say, quite a big personality, a zest for life. He was a great storyteller, a lifelong Aston Villa fan, hence the colours of the flowers today. He travelled all around Europe watching his beloved team. It culminated in watching them lift the European Cup in 1982. Great memories, I'm sure, he held of that time. Roger was a true sportsman not only in watching sport, but also playing. In his early years, he played football, where he was nicknamed Pass to the Side Sparrow. He also considered himself a half-decent batsman and a wicketkeeper, and of course, golf, which ultimately became his passion. He was born on the 5th of August, 1949, in Rogerstone, in Newport, 
possibly that's where he got the name Roger from. He was the only child to Alf and Florence. He was cousin to Pauline, Vanessa and David, all on his mother's side. And then the family moved to Charnwood Road in Great Bar from Newport, where he spent his childhood, ultimately attending King Edward Grammar School for Boys. He loved playing the drums, and at an early age he joined a band. In later life he would often compare himself to the greats, including Phil Collins. I'm not quite sure he ever attained that status. At the age of 16 he took his first job as an apprentice at the post office where he spent four years working as a telephone engineer. And it was during that period that he met Pat, or Trish as she's known. They married in October 1967 and that would be where the family began. In fact, his little boy Julian came along just three months later. I'll leave you to do the maths, but all I can say is the wedding was certainly a family affair. Three years later, his little girl Andrea was born and the family was now complete. Well, almost, because I need to mention the family dog, Judy. Certainly when she came along, the family was complete. And after the post office, Roger joined Timex in 1971, where he sold watches to jewellers across the southeast of England. And this role took the family away from the Midlands, where they set up home in Bristol. Now, Roger was always told that um, Julian, as a young boy of about five years old, in Roger's words, Julian ran outside to buy ice cream for Andrea and himself. And I was watching Julian from the window to make sure he was okay. Julian was walking back to the house with two ice creams and he noticed I was watching him. He then got quite cocky and started strutting and dancing back to the house with an ice cream in each hand. Suddenly he dropped one. He stopped in his tracks, he looked down at the mess on the floor. His head rose and he looked straight at me and said, I've dropped Andrea's ice cream. <laughs> and I know your dad's told that story numerous, numerous times, certainly whenever there was a big gathering, so it's only correct that I include that one today. In 1973, Roger joined Honeywell, where he spent the remainder of his working life until 2005, when he finally retired. Roger met many of his good friends whilst he worked at Honeywell, including Pete and Brian, who are here today, I believe. And that was the start of some great friendships, where the famous golf tournaments began. And to this day, they compete for the famous Thurston Bucket each year. But to share some more memories of the Thurston Bucket and Roger in general, I'm now going to ask his good friend Pete Silk to come forward to share some memories. Thank you. Just watch us down. Oh, it's all right for you. Okay. I'm afraid uh, some of the stuff we've just heard is going to be repeating a bit. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I first met Roger way back in 1969, a lifetime ago, when, we, when he joined the Honeywell sales team in Erdington. Uh, our leader at that time was a guy called Brian Ripper, who interviewed him and appointed him as a sales engineer. Uh, Roger, Brian Elliott and a fellow Honeywell and I, sorry, Brian Elliott, who was a fe fellow Honeywell and I, soon struck up a close and remarkable friendship, which has continued ever since. The three of us have kept in touch with our old boss, Brian, over the years, and we managed to relive our past events during every occasional get-together. Roger completed a successful career, as we've just heard, up to his retirement at Honeywell and was proud to be elected to the Honeywell President's Club for outstanding performance. 
a prestigious international award. Now I've got fond memories of a long friendship in which we've shared so many wonderful times and which span quite a few areas, one of which was family holidays at home and abroad. The first one of which one day uh, we decided we would travel uh, for a two-week holiday in South Brittany. In one car, Roger, Pat, who was pregnant with Andrea, Julian, age two, Pam and I, and our son Chris, who was six months old, all in one car, one day. <laughs> yes, we all got to know each other very well. And it was the first of many fun holidays to come. Then, as we've heard, there was music. My wife Pam first met Roger when we went to a concert uh, featuring the Moody Blues at the Belfry Hotel, which is just down the road from here. Roger loved his music, and as we've heard, at 19 years of age he was playing drums for a band during most evenings. Over the years we attended numerous concerts watching some great bands, names like Fleetwood Mac, Deep Purple, Genesis, which is the Phil Collins connection, Pink Floyd, Eric Clapton, The Eagles, and more. His all-time favourite show, which he really loved, was The uh, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, uh, which is a Genesis rock opera. We played that music uh, so many times over the years. Roger was also a keen and accomplished sportsman with a great hand-eye coordination and a natural ability. He enjoyed taking part in many sports. Football, cricket, golf and skiing were prominent in his life. In the early 70s, we played football for a great well-known team called Canterbury United. And Roger was a useful midfield player, I have to say. Uh, not too good at heading the ball, that was not his strength, but a good midfield player. And I can recall his post-match comical remarks about our knees-up fullback, Freddie Baker. And how many times did he tell the tale of us playing against a West Indian team, an all-West Indian team, when one of their supporters howled from the touchline, Hey, Mum, why you let that fat man run past you? <laughs> then Roger, in his smug fashion, would announce that that fat man was me. <laughs> we had great times together following our team, Aston Villa, home and away for many years. Very often with Brian Ellis as well, Brian's here. Even uh, when they were in the two third, uh, third division uh, seasons, just two of them, but we, we were there then as well. How we loved watching the talent of Gordon Cowns, the man he worshipped. Probably our favourite ever Villa player, and of course, as we've heard, that trip to Rotterdam, together, in, the 1982, in 1982 for the European Cup final with Bayern Munich. Both in tears when our captain, Dennis Mortimer, raised the trophy as winners. Jules tells me that Roger was still interested in Villa's performances and results right up to his final days. Eventually, Roger got hooked on golf. Largely due to our mate, Brian Elliott, a Scottish soldier. Where are you, Brian? There he is. Brian had previously played golf in Scotland as a club member and therefore was able to coach us in the finer arts of the game. And it never left us. Roger loved playing the game and was proud to become captain of the Warwickshire Golf Club many years later. He was also captain and motivator of the less prestigious Devon Boys A team. Those trips to Devon for eight of us, the A's versus the B's, were centred on the Thurston Golf Club near Gainsbridge, and have been something of, uh, to relish and reminisce over for, for over 40 years. Roger organised those events mostly, and he provided so much joy, fun and entertainment each year. Will we ever forget that trusty red four wood, or those niggling words as he walked off the green, five four for two points? And also he invented his own stroke, a famous golf stroke, called the Sparrow Scuttle, which Tim will remember. <laughs> we competed for three trophies, which now have a magical ring and each have a story to tell. The Thurston Shield, the Norman Boy Trophy, and the Devon Masters. And Roger's name, of course, appears as a holder on all three many times. And I know Roger would want me to mention another of his favourite golf adventures, which started over 20 years ago, 
He, Brian, and the late great Rob Saunders and I decided to test our skills on the links of Royal Birkdale, which led to many more annual visits to various links golf courses on the Lancashire coast. On every occasion, Roger and I competed each day over 36 holes with Brian and Rob. That trusty red forward and the five four for two made us undefeated winners of that magnificent trophy, the Birkdale Bucket, which was an ice bucket which he'd picked up somewhere along the way. And it was something we really played our hearts out to win. Remember it, Brian? The evening sessions in downtown Southport, with Roger always on top form, were incredibly special and exhausting. Overnight stays provided other competitive activities while supping the odd glass of ale and a pint of otter comes to mind. We regularly played darts, pool and the relentless game of spoof and Roger was a handy darts player, having represented the White Lion darts team in Sutton Coalfield along with a few of us and we often mused at his deliberate throwing style and wondered at times whether he would ever release the arrow. He was adept at pool but was somewhat luckless over the years at spoof bit of a gambling game. I, rem I can remember one year in desperation Roger arriving with a well thought out fail safe system to improve his outcomes. That year he bought more rounds of beer at the bar than ever. Roger em embellished all aspects of his adventures in his own inimitable way. He thrived on the company of others and gave so much fun and enjoyment. As we all know he was a brilliant raconteur with a sharp mind and a wicked sense of humour. He was funny, enthusiastic and infectious to be with. I know he thought the world of his family. He would always share a photo of George and give me an update on his progress. I know how much he appreciated and valued the selfless support and care he received from Nilla, Andrea, Julian and Matthew in the recent troubled months of his ill health. It's so hard to witness a dear friend suffer such a decline in health. But Roger showed great courage and put up a great fight to the end. He's a special person and I'm, I will miss him. I suspect he will right now be making up a four ball with our fellow teammates who have previously passed on, Norman Boyd, Rob Saunders and Rog Keeley for a round of golf at Heaven's Golf Club. It's time to say goodbye mate. Thanks for an unforgettable 50 years. Thank you. Is that yours? Is that yours? Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to nick all my paperwork now. <laughs> Some wonderful memories for all of you there. But continuing on with Roger's life story. Moving to Droitwich in 1974, I believe that's where you started your school life. And, of course, being a huge Aston Villa fan, it didn't take long for Roger to name the family home Villa de Aston. Big parrot letters for the whole street to be able to see. And this is when Roger spent five days a week getting up at 4am in the morning to take his young Droitwich Dolphin swimming training. Julian and Andrea recall that wasn't their choice. Although, Andrea, I believe you did excel and went on to swim for the county. Roger would openly tell everybody that he knew that he was the dedicated sportsman dragging his children out of the bed at 4 a.m. every morning. And it was during this time the family spent many holidays in Muddyfoot in a caravan. Julian, you recall that even at an early age it was normally raining and often the caravan park was flooded, but you seemed to enjoy some fantastic days spent on the beach. And after this I would holiday with friends, as you've mentioned, in the south of France camping. And this is another one of the stories that Roger always used to tell. In fact, he told this even at Julian and Alison's wedding. I suppose Julian would have been around 13 and Andrea about 10. And they were settling into the tent or the famous ambulance that Derek and Maureen used to drive to France. And then during that typical evening, the families would go down to the restaurant and the bar, 
have an evening meal. And once this was finished, the children would head back to the tents, whilst the so-called adults would remain to, shall we say, drink copious amounts. When they left the bar, Roger noticed the wind had got up. In fact, he commented, I hope the tent's okay. And as they arrived back at the tent, the wind was howling, the tent was flapping around in the gale. And it was then that Roger saw his little babies holding on to the tent for dear life. Julian remember being about 13 years of age. And as Roger walked up the dirt track to the tent, he was greeted by Julian saying, Where the fuck have you been? <laughs> imagine that story at the wedding as well would have got so many laughs. In 1983 of course the family moved to Sutton Coalfield and that's where the children finished their schooling. Roger was able to be closer to his friends as you mentioned he joined the darts team at the White Lion. I don't think they did that well probably because Roger got very drunk quite often and in 1996 Roger very proudly gave Andrea away to Ian. Roger was very fond of Ian, even if he'd lost his little girl to a blue nose. I think the speech at the wedding made it very clear that as a result of that, Andrea had in fact been removed from the will, and Julian, you had the pleasure of being the sole beneficiary to his entire debt. He was a proud best man to Julian on his wedding day, welcoming Alison to the family, but alas, she was yet another blue nose. But <laughs> Roger always made sure that the conversation turned to the European Cup winning Rotterdam and Aston Villa. And if anybody was travelling to Europe, he was more than happy to give directions to them. In 1997, he took a two-year contract in South Africa with Sally. Julian recalled it was perfect timing as they were able to share their honeymoon over in South Africa, which in fact you did. They returned back to England in 1999, and that's where Roger took up his last role as European Channel Manager until he retired in 2005. Back with his friends, rejoining the golf the tours were now back on course. And then, of course, the family extended. In August 2001, Roger became a very proud granddad to George. He was welcomed into the world and became the apple of Roger's eye. Roger had a fantastic imagination and a fantastic sense of humour. And little did Andrea and Ian know that the day George was born, that the dad would start a daily diary and you actually showed me those diaries and read pieces to me and they really were humorous. I mean just to give you an example for example, Wednesday the 3rd of October 2001, mum took me to see some childcare nurseries today. It looks like they're going to leave me with complete strangers so mum can go back to work. Nanny Apples and Nanny Peg said they're going to form an escape committee to get me out. Dad's got a new word, I must look it up. Relegation. <laughs> Another one, Saturday the 27th of October. Dad was very tired. Then Villa beat Bolton to go top of the Premier. Dad's headache got worse. <laughs> Mum went out with the girls, so Dad looked after me. We were up all night worrying about the villa. Roger even talk, took George out for a day, and little did the family know until the photographs arrived back that he'd actually taken him to Villa Park. In 2006, Roger met Nilla, and they became a family in Kenilworth with Nilla's son, Matthew. Lena and her two boys, Sean and Ethan, and at that point in Roger's life, golf, I believe, played a really major part of it. As you know, he was named captain at the Warwickshire Golf and Country Club, where he made a lot of new friends. He attended weekly quizzes with them all, playing competitions, 
and I know to this day there is an annual competition named after Roger, the Sparrow Salva. Um, I think Roger never actually managed to win this one, though, did he, Nilla? Roger and Nilla enjoyed their free time together, playing golf, spending time with Matthew, and enjoying holidays on their own and with friends. And Roger took so much care of Nilla and Matthew, especially Nilla's cats. Also the neighbourhood cats at times as well. Uh, they would enter the house and the cats seemed to just love to sit on Roger's lap all night. Now, as you know, in 2012, Roger was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and this was an illness that rocked the whole of his family. He never gave in to that disease. In fact, he fought it as much as he could. He attended Parkinson's classes where he made a lot of new friends. That was how popular he was, a measure of the true man that he was. And as the disease took hold, Nilla, you became not only his partner, but also his carer. And I know you did an amazing job. And Julian and Andrea have said they could never thank you enough for what you did for Roger. Helping hands became a firm part of their life in Kenilworth, again making great friends, in particular a young lady called Happiness. And she truly had the most perfect name, caring for Roger with such dignity and compassion. And sadly on his birthday this year, Roger was admitted to hospital. He'd suffered a fall, he then tested positive for COVID-19. It was another setback for him and his Parkinson's became worse. And this would turn out to be the hardest decision that Julian and Andrea have ever had to make because following advice from the hospital and the consultants, the, the decision was made that he would be moved to Kenilworth Grange for full nursing and finally moved to a permanent residence at Aldridge Court on the 2nd of November. Of course, COVID-19 has been traumatic for everybody. The family were unable to see Roger during his time in Kenilworth Grange. Nilla, I know you were lucky enough to spend 30 minutes socially distanced, and sadly that was all the family could ever have. Roger remained strong throughout, and when he moved to Aldridge Court, they were able to see him through his bedroom window. Roger always would ask how everybody was. He made sure his children told Nilla and Matthew how much he loved them. His strength and his compassion was instilled with him right to the end, and Roger passed away peacefully in his sleep on the 12th of November, knowing that his family and his loved ones were well looked after. Each of you here have your own personal memory of Roger. Roger was a huge part of this family. He was there for all the good times this family had to offer. He was also there for life's more difficult times, somebody that you could turn to for guidance and for support. And each of you have your own memories of him. And it's those memories that you have that will help you in the coming weeks and months as you come to terms with the shock and the loss of Roger. And so I'm going to ask you now to hold a special memory of Roger in your own mind, a memory that you will personally look back on. And as you think about Roger, we're going to listen together to a piece of music chosen especially for today's service, Wondrous Stories by Yes.
Neil has asked me to read the poem, He is Gone, the words of which you'll find in the centre of the order of service. You can shed tears that he is gone, or you can smile because he lived. You can close your eyes and pray that he will come back, or you can open your eyes and see all that he has left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see him, or you can be full of the love that you shared. You can turn your back on tomorrow and live yesterday, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember him and only that he's gone, or you can cherish his memories and let those live on. You can cry, close your mind, be empty and turn your back. Or you could do what he would want. Smile, open your eyes, love and go on. I can ask you now please to bow your heads as we say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, ever and ever. Amen. And now if I could ask those who are able, please, to stand. When I come to the end of the road, and the sun has set for me, I want no tears in a gloom-filled room. Why cry for a soul set free? Miss me a little, but not for long and not with your head held low. Remember the love that we once shared. Miss me, but let me go. And so having taken time together to remember and to celebrate Roger's life, we come to this, the saddest part of today's service, as we say our final goodbye. And so Roger, in this act of ceremony, I now commit your body to be coming to you. Ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. Reunited with all those who've gone before. Roger, your memories will live on. May you rest in peace. If I can ask you now to be seated. Just before I bring today's service to a close, the family through me have asked me first of all to thank you all for your attendance here today. And also some special thanks First of all to Warwickshire Golf and Country Club members for all their support and to Jerry for collecting all the emails and messages together to pass on to the family. Of course we're unable to meet and celebrate Roger's life and the family have said that when all these Covid restrictions are lifted they will organise uh, a party for Roger's life. And finally, 
Donations, if you wish to make to uh, Roger, can be given to Parkinson's UK. There is a link on the back of the order service, or as we leave the chapel, there's a collection box if you prefer to give some cash, or you can send it on to ourselves to deal with for you. And finally, these orders of service are yours to keep, so please do take those with you as a memory of Roger and also of today's funeral service. Everything you've heard me say today has been written or chosen by the family. When I visited, I said I would find some words to close today's service with, and I've chosen something that I hope will bring all of you some comfort. But what I want you to do is imagine that it's not me standing here talking, but in fact, Roger speaking to you all one final time. To the living, I am God. To the sorrowful, I will never return. To the angry, I was cheated. But to the happy, I am now at peace. And to the faithful, well, I have never left. I cannot speak, but I can listen. I cannot be seen, but I can be heard. So as you stand upon the shore, gazing at the beautiful sea, Remember me. And as you look in awe at a mighty forest in its grand majesty, remember me. Remember me in your hearts. Remember me in your thoughts. The memories of those times we loved. The times we cried. The battles we fought. And the times we laughed. For if you always think of me, I will never have gone. Roger, it was an honour and a privilege to be asked to conduct your service today. May you rest in peace.
I made him proud. You made him yeah. so proud. Yeah. Yeah. He was always proud of you. Yeah, yeah. he was. And he'd be proud yeah, of you now. Right. And the nice thing about it, he always oh, when he just said that he 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 was a dog down there. <laughs>
Oh, Royal Northampton. Oh, not. I didn't go there. We went, all the we went to Royal Northampton and, and Roger, <laughs> Roger lost them. Well. He's getting married. You're not, though, Tim. Married? <laughs> <laughs> all the best lines, all the best chances. <laughs> yeah, not, um, yeah, Royal Northampton. <laughs> Thank you. 